So as Kevin says, the title of my talk today is Species Structure, I can't write today, and Stuff. And when I say and stuff, I don't just mean like and other things, I mean a thing which is called stuff. Uh, which hopefully I'm going to get a chance to speak about, although knowing how time tends to fly in these things, I probably won't. So, um, just to give you a brief outline of what I want to cover. First of all, it's probably worth, if I'm going to be speaking about species, telling you what a species is. So, I'm going to tell you what a species is, and why we should care about them. When I've defined a species, I'm going to start playing with them. And the way you play with things is by doing operations on them. So, operations on the species, addition, multiplication, and composition are the ones I'm going to focus on, but you can, um, you can also differentiate them, you can uh, do the single pointing, there's a bunch of other um, operations that I'm not going to get a chance to cover. Then we're going to talk about generating series, so generating series. So associated with each species is a formal power series. And the formal power series can tell you a lot about the uh, number of structures of a given kind on a set of size n, especially when you combine it with operations on species, you get some cool results coming out. So hopefully I'm going to prove um, KV's theorem on the number of rooted trees or unrooted trees on a uh, set of size n. And then finally, and this is like becoming dubious time-wise, but hopefully I'll have enough time to at least discuss briefly um, the notion of property, structure, and stuff. So this is where, so all of this here is combinatorics, and this here is now going into the realm of logic. And since I'm a logician, it's sort of the stuff at the bottom, and there are a few sections that I wasn't even really going to begin writing about. So it's, it's the stuff from here and beyond. That level of abstraction is what I'm interested in. Uh, but because I have to learn about these things anyway, um, I'm going to be focusing more on the combinatorics today. So since most of you in the audience seem to be ACO people, that's probably a reasonable thing. Um, so uh, I should also give a disclaimer. I'm not a combinatorialist, and I've been learning about these things for about a week. So um, my expertise is not very high at the moment. Um, but nonetheless, I'm writing a set of notes on these things, so um, I guess they will eventually be available for my website. I may as well put the URL up, so it'll be math.cmu.edu slash tilde c m e w s t e a. It's like my first initial and last name, but without the D at the end. So the notes will be available when I correct some typos and stuff, and I guess Kevin might put a link in the YouTube to get us some check. We shall work it out. Okay, so are we happy? Comes the food. Are we all happy? Yeah, Joe? Oh, yeah, thumb up. Yes. Good stuff. Good stuff. Oh, I'm like, <laughs> I agree. Okay, so the first section, I said I would speak about species. So I have to tell you what a species is, and I'm not going to tell you what a species is just yet. So let's just look at finite sets. So take a set with n elements. some kind of finite set. Usually when I write set today, I'm going to mean a finite set. You can ask yourself what it means to put a structure on you. And there are like a whole bunch of different structures that you could put on you. So for example, you could just consider you as a set. You has exactly one structure as a set, it's just you itself. So that's kind of boring. Um, as is customary in graduate student seminar talks, I should probably talk about what it means to put a graph structure on you. So um, we can put a... Uh, graph structure on you. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means equipping you with a set E, where E is a set of unordered pairs of elements of you. So E is a subset of U2, where this is a set of unordered pairs of elements of you. Um, typically, this is denoted by representing the elements of U as vertices, and the elements of E is edges. So for example, if the set containing these two things is in E, then I draw an edge. So it might look like this, or 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 you know, if you go on for quite a while. Um, so that's what a graph is. Some people like putting directed graph structures on their sets. So directed graph. 
This is now the same thing. Do a quick U with a set E, except this time E comes from the set of ordered pairs of elements in U. So that would be the same as endowing each of these with an orientation, and then you could have things going back in the other direction, or whatever. That's what the directed graph looks like. Um, I suppose I should take out the diagonal subset so you can't have pairs like U, U. Um, then there's tree structures, which is what happens when you can't have any loops. So this is emphatically not a tree, but this thing is. This is not, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so all sorts of graphy type things, combinatorialists in the audience will be very familiar with those. Um, but we can do a bunch of other stuff as well. So we could put, for example, a linear order. Or a linear ordering of u. Well, what's that? That's just a way of writing out all the elements of u in an order. So if you think about deciding that this is the first element, this is the second element, this is the third element, and so on, that's the same as finding a bijection <coughs> from the set of numbers from 1 up to n to u. So you consider the image of 1 to be the first element of u, the image of 2 to be the second element, the third element, and so on. Along similar lines, you might want to equip u with a permutation. So if you want to consider sets that come equipped with sort of a way of transforming the set into itself in a potentially non-trivial way, you could say a permutation uh, of u. Well, that's quite simply a bijection from u to itself. So these two things look similar. u is a set with n elements. So a bijection from n to u should be the same as a permutation of u to itself. And actually, when I was teaching last semester, that's exactly what the professor told the students. And what I'm going to do today is going to prove him wrong. Um, so these are all examples of structures. There are some algebraic structures that you can put on. So normally species are studied from the point of view of combinatorics. But there's no reason why you can't bring in some abstract algebra as well. So you can put in a group structure. On you. Well, what's that going to be? Well, you need to pick an identity element an inverse function, so it sends every element to its inverse, and a multiplication function. So e is an element of u, i is a function from u to u, m is a function from pairs of u, so it takes u and v and it products them, uh, such that you know all the rules of all the axioms of group theory hold. So that's another structure that you can put on it. So <clears throat> when we look at these things, it's worth um, Noting that like these all satisfy the notion of what we think a structure should be. So why don't we try and work out what structure is and study it in the abstract? So that's what a species is ultimately going to do, but I have to motivate the definition before I give it, otherwise it's not going to make any sense. So <clears throat> let's just look at the kinds of things that these have in common. Graphs and directed graphs and trees and whatever are all going to behave the same because they're all just kinds of graphs. But what about if we compare like a graph structure and a linear ordering, or a graph structure and a permutation, or something along those lines? So, what can we say about those? Well, if you're familiar with graph theory, yes, can I ask a question? Of course. Does such that the kind of needed would, would that be like um, uh, property, or is that still a structure? Um, do you mean in comparison to just equipping it with these three functions? That would be a property. Yes, so Ed is foreshadowing what I'm going to be talking about later. There's property, structure, and stuff. No, no, that's fine, that's fine. <coughs> so, yeah. So you could theoretically just equip a, you could call it maybe a free group. A free group is probably a thing that exists, and this is probably not what it is. But for the purpose of like right now, you could just equip a set with an element, a function, and another function without requiring the axioms of group theory to hold, and then you could just call that a tree group or something, and then like tree groups that satisfy the axioms and then group groups or something like that. So a nice property of all of these things is we can ultimately just relabel the elements of U and obtain something that's kind of equivalent. So if you're given a bijection, say sigma from u to some other set b, well, u and v are going to have the same number of elements. All I'm doing here is re-labeling the elements of u. I'm going to obtain a new graph, which looks identical to my old graph. So if u, e is a graph, then I'm going to obtain a new graph, v, and some, I'm going to write it sigma dot e. 
So this is now a graph where I've just relabeled all the elements of u, and the edges are just going to correspond with, well, what are they? I'm going to stick in the edge sigma u, sigma v, provided that the edge uv is an edge of the first graph. Um, so I guess I can draw this pictorially. Like if you have the graph 1, 2, 3, and then you have the elements a, b, c, and you map 1 to a, 2 to b, and 3 to c, the graph you end up with looks a little bit like this one. It's so trivial it almost hurts to write it on the board. Um, with linear orderings, that's kind of similar, I guess. So a good linear ordering, um, that's going to be a bijection from n to u. This means that we've listed all the elements of u as u1, u2, up to un, where like uk is just l of k, if you like. Then this is going to give us a linear ordering sigma dot l. This is now going to be a linear ordering of v, where now we just say sigma of u1 is first, sigma of u2 is second, and so on, and sigma of un is last. So this thing is actually just the composite of L with sigma. So the way I obtain, <coughs> given the bijection, the way I obtain a linear ordering of the image set is to just compose it with the linear ordering of the first one. Moreover, <coughs> And this is where my own interests come in, I'm a category theorist. Uh, this action is functorial. So what does that mean? So this is functorial. All that that means is it's compatible with composition and identity. So that means that if you give me bijections, say sigma and tau, from a finite set to another finite set to another finite set, then if I do tau after sigma, and I look at the action on a given structure, so this here might be the graph structure, or it might be the linear ordering, it might be a permutation, then that's the same as doing tau to what I get out when I do sigma to the ordering. And likewise, if I look at the identity function on my set, and I apply that to the structure, then I'm just going to get my structure back. So that's what I mean when I say that this action is functorial. Are there any questions so far? I am going pretty fast, Jacob. So if this is functorial, uh, what, what exactly are the objects and what are the morphisms in this? Uh, uh -huh. A fine question! <laughs> 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 Which I will answer if there are no other questions. <laughs> <laughs> so this motivates the following definition, which will answer Jacob's question. So this is due to Andre Joyal. 1981, André Joyal is a category theorist. He's a French Canadian, um, which means that the paper that he published in 1981 on these things is entirely in French, uh, which was made this slightly more difficult for me when I was trying to learn what these things were. Um, so the definition of a species is quite simply a species is a functor. from a category which I'm going to call B to itself, where B is the category of finite sets and whose morphisms are bijections between them. And I know that only about four people in the audience understand what I mean when I say this, so I'm going to spell out this definition. But to answer Jacob's question, the objects are finite sets and the morphisms are bijections between them. So, <coughs> Here, for example, given a bijection between finite sets, we obtain a graph isomorphism. Uh, but the graph isomorphism is just a bijection, so um, where will I go with this? Yeah. So what does this mean? So that means a species... Uh, what this means is that given a finite set u, I would say a new finite set f of u. And given any bijection, I obtain a new bijection where the source and target are compatible, so f of u and f of v. So I obtain a new function f of sigma from f of u to f of v. 
such that it's compatible with composition and identity, in the sense that if I compose two things, then I get the composite. Or if I apply f to a composite, I get the composite. <coughs> And if I apply f to an identity, then I get the identity of what I got when I, before I applied f. So again, to some of you, currently, you will be completely zoned out, because this is at such a level of abstraction that it's not going to make any sense, and it probably doesn't make any sense to you how, in any way, this relates to the examples I was giving before. Like, finite sets and finite sets, where are the linear orderings, where are the graphs, where are the permutations? Where are the trees? Where are the pointer trees? Where are the groups, for God's sake? So, I'm going to explicitly tell you some examples of species and what they do on objects and what they do on bijections, and then we'll hopefully, together, get a better intuition for what these things are, because I am still kind of, uh, <laughs> not quite there yet, but together we'll get that. So, let's look at this. So, how about um, some examples? So, there's the species of graphs. So a species of graphs is going to be a rule, which I'm going to call gra, because that's a nice abbreviation. And gra is going to take a finite set and give me a finite set. And that's going to be related to graphs somehow. Well, what it's going to do is it's going to take a finite set u, and it's going to give me the set of all graph structures on u. Well, a graph structure on u is just the pair u e, where e is a set of an ordered pairs from u. Right? So that's a finite set. There are only finitely many graph structures that you could put on a set of size n. Um, um, what about graph of sigma dot u? Well, sorry, graph of sigma if u goes if sigma goes from u to v. So given a bijection between finite sets, sigma from u to v, I'm now going to obtain a bijection. So this is like, I don't know, let's call it, what should I call this? I'm going to call this sigma hat from u e to what we're doing here. Sorry, I'm going too quickly. This is going to be a function from gra of u to gra of v. So given a bijection, it has to take in a graph structure on u and spit out a graph structure on v. Well, given the graph structure u e, it's just going to spit out the graph structure v sigma dot e. That is, we're just going to relabel all the vertices and keep the edges where they are. Okay. Making sense? Any questions so far? I'm going to do like three more examples. Actually, no, I'm going to do like five more examples. So I hope, <laughs> I hope this is making sense so far, because if it's not, then everything I say in the future will make even less sense. So please do ask me questions. Um, OK, I'll do the species of permutations. So, what is this going to do? I'm going to call this perm. So perm of u is going to take in, so perm takes in a set, finite set, and spits out a finite set. The finite set it's going to spit out is going to be the set of all permutation structures on u. So it's going to be the set of all ways of equipping u with a permutation of itself. So this is going to be the set of all pairs, say u sigma, sigma is a bad word to use, bad letter. So u f, where f is a bijection from u to itself. So all this is is saying, give me a set and tell me all of the ways that I can equip it with a bijection. In other words, just tell me all the bijections. There are, what, n factorial of these, something like that. <coughs> so now I have to think, OK, well, given a bijection from a set u to a set v, how can I get a permutation of v given a permutation of u? So what this is going to do is send u f to <coughs> Well, I need a permutation of v, and I need to work out what question mark to put here. So if I'm given a permutation of u, I want to get a permutation of v, that's the question mark. Well, I have a function from u to v, namely sigma. So if I do sigma inverse and then f and then sigma, then I get a bijection from v to v. So this here is going to be sigma inverse, sorry, Composition goes the other way around, sigma f, sigma inverse. So conjugation by sigma gives me a bijection from v to v. So 
the action of bijections on permutations is conjugation. Is that enough patience for you? Um, now let's look at the species of linear organisms. We've already, I've already told you what this is. So if you give me a set, then lin u is going to tell me all the ways I can linearly order u. So it's going to be u f, where this time f is a bijection from the set n to the set u. So the set of numbers from 1 up to the site. u is the set of size n. Okay, and that's what n means. Um, so it's going to just tell me all the pairs u f, where f is a linear ordering of u, that is a list, you know, assignment of the numbers 1 up to n to all of the elements. So then lin of sigma, well, what's this going to do? It's going to take a linear ordering on u to a linear ordering on v. And now I have to work out what question that is. Well, I've got a linear ordering on u, and I've got a bijection from u to v. So sigma f is going to be the new linear ordering on v. So that's uh, sigma f. Yes, that's right. And this is a bijection, and so again, we've got new linear ordering. And the fact that this thing and this thing are why, when I was saying earlier that the professor was wrong last semester, telling the students that permutations and linear orderings were the same thing. So these behave differently, even though on the face of it, they look very much the same. Questions so far? So really, all of these examples, all we're doing is just <coughs> relabeling things. So when you say uh, differently, you mean that there, there does not exist a natural transformation between those? Yes, so there is a notion of um, equality of species, which I'm going to talk about but not define. Those categorically minded among you will want to know what that is. Well, um, we consider two species to be equal if there is a natural isomorphism between them. So morphisms of species are things called natural transformations. It means that they behave nicely with these bijections. And if you can do that in an almost bijective way, then we consider them equal. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that definition. Um, feel free to speak to me about it afterwards. But the, the idea is that like these behave differently, and behaving differently is usually a sign that you're going to be unequal. Any other questions? Cool stuff's coming. But before we get to the cool stuff, I need to define four like really boring, really boring species. They're so boring that I'm going to reserve a special space for them so that you can remember what they are. It's going to be like this one. So the first one is something that I'm going to call E. E is the species of spaces. It's E for two reasons. The first of which is that the word for, sorry, species of sets. The reason, uh, so the first reason why it's E is because the French word for set is ensemble, which begins with an E. And the second reason is that this is going to be associated with the power series expansion of E to the X, and we're going to get there soon. So E is the species of sets, and it's defined as follows. Well, E of a set U is just going to be the set of ways of putting a set structure on U. Well, there's one way of doing that, and the set structure is just U. <coughs> And then bijections of, you know, play what they're going to do. Um, X is going to be the species which is characteristic of singletons. And what X is going to do is it's going to take a set and ask it, how many elements do you have? And if your set turns around and says, 15, it's going to say, you cannot have a singleton structure. So, uh, <laughs> there, are going to be, there are going to be no ways of putting a singleton structure on a set if it has more than one element. But if it does have an element, it's going to say, oh, you're, it's your lucky day. And it's going to give it the structure of a singleton, it's just going to return itself. So, this is if you has one element. Um, the other two are even more boring. You Are we happy now? <laughs> um, one is going to be the species which is characteristic of the empty set. So one of you is going to be you 
if u is the empty set and nothing otherwise, and zero is going to be the empty species, and every set comes up and says, hey, can you give me a structure? And it says, no. <laughs> The empty species assigns to every set the empty set, and it assigns to every bijection the empty function from the empty set to the empty set, which, if you check your definitions, is a bijection, um, thereby proving, and so, well, it's a function for a start, thereby proving that 0 to the 0 does equal 1 unambiguously. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, great. So we've got a bunch of species at our disposal. So I guess we should start talking about what we can do with these things. So far I've just given you a definition. And whenever I'm teaching and I give a definition, I always tell people if they don't understand what the definition means or if they don't have a clue what it is, I always say you should really be aggressive and ask me why they should care about it. So before you guys get all aggressive and ask me why you should care about it, I'm going to tell you uh, some things you can do with it. So at least you know that they're fun even if they have no application. Okay? So um, we're going to talk about operations on species. questions at this point in time? How are we doing for time? Not too badly. Okay. Now, I've kind of spoiled the story by telling you that I'm going to associate to each, series, to each species a generating series. So, the reason why I'm calling these operations the things I'm calling them is because they're going to correspond with the operations on power series that we get out when we do that. So, we're going to start by talking about addition <coughs> of species. And this definition is going to seem fairly arbitrary, but I promise it's going to make sense too. So, if you're given two species, f and g, f and g throughout this are going to be species, I'm not going to bother clarifying that point. Then, we're going to define a new species, f plus g. Well, what's that going to be? It's going to be a species, so you need to know what it does on objects and what it does on morphisms. That is, what it does on finite sets. Well, on a finite set u, it's going to give me the disjoint union of f u and g u. So if we're thinking of f of u as being the set of structures on u described by f, and g of u as being the set of structures on u described by g, an f plus g structure is just something which is either an f structure or a g structure. Okay? So <clears throat> I'll give you a very stupid example. Um, so We've already seen the species of sets. This uh, tells you if your thing is a set or not. And the species corresponding to the species that's characteristic of the empty set, it tells you whether your set is empty or not. I'm going to define a new species. E plus is going to be the species characteristic of non-empty sets. What this is going to do is return u if u is non-empty and return the empty set if it is. And the fact that every set is either empty or non-empty is going to be expressed by the species equation E, that is, my thing is a set, if it is either empty or it is not empty. So what does this mean? Well, E of U is going to be the distant <coughs> union of... <clears throat> let's look at what this does. Okay. E of U. Let's look at this. Well... This is going to be the disjoint union of one of you with E plus of you. If U is empty, this is not empty and this is empty, so I'm going to get an element of this thing. If U is not empty, this is empty and this is not empty, so I'm going to get an element of this thing. So that means that, you know, this is expressing the fact that every set is either empty or not empty. Really stupid example, um, but we need to have this because we're going to be doing slightly more complicated stuff momentarily. <coughs> Questions? How do you define this joint union? However you want, in your favorite way. It's any any co-product in the category of sets. <laughs> so a disjoint union b equals a cross zero union b cross one or something like that. And again, this I brushed under I brushed this under the rug. I told you I'm not going to tell you what this means. This is natural isomorphism. So this is not an equality of sets. But it's a natural bijection of sets. Okay. This is a, an abuse.
use of terminology, which I'm going to continue to use without apology for the entire talk. So, so how would you define the, uh, uh, the map that is associated to each? Oh, page? yeah, I should have told you that. Yeah, I'll do that. So, f plus g of a map from u to v. What's this going to do? Well, this is going to give me a map from the disjoint union of f of u and g of u to the disjoint union of f of v and g of v. So it's going to give me, you know, say s. So s is going to be an element of f u disjoint union g of u. Well, this is either going to give me f of sigma of s if s is in f of u. That's certainly an f of v, or it's going to give me g of sigma of s if s is in g of u. And those are the only two cases because they're mutually exclusive, so it's well defined and blah 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 blah. <coughs> are the logicians happy? <laughs> yes. Okay, the combinatorial is solved, so I'm going to continue. Yeah. Um, so we can also multiply. We can multiply in two ways. And I'm not going to tell you the other way. So if I were to write f cross g, that would mean a different thing from f dot g. So unlike numbers, you can't do that. So I'm going to tell you f dot g. What f dot g of u does is it says, well, I want to assign an f structure to some of u and a g structure to some of u. And then I guess we'll do an example of this momentarily. So this is going to seem like really weird when I give the definition, but I promise you it makes sense. So what this is going to do is, well, first of all, I'm going to partition u into u1 and u2. And then I'm going to give u1 an f structure and u2 a g structure. But I'm not going to say which way I'm going to do that. So I'm taking the disjoint union over all of the partitions of u. u1 and u2 partitions of u. And I'm going to give an f structure to the first bit and a g structure to the second. So this is saying is that an f dot g structure on u is, for some choice of partition of u, an f structure on the first part of the partition and a g structure on the second part of the partition. So I'm going to give you, um, what's the easiest to understand now? Let's do it this way. And you can, whenever I define these things on objects, at this level of generality, there is only ever one way of describing on bijection. So you just look at the definition hard enough and you see what it has to be. So I'm not going to tell you anymore what it does on bijections. But the idea is it does sigma restricted to u1 on this bit, and sorry, f of sigma restricted to u1 on this bit, and f of g of sigma restricted to u2 on this bit. Okay. Um, where was I? So, okay. Let's take some set u and consider what a permutation of the elements of u looks like. Well, some elements might stay fixed. These are not all the fixed elements. I'm going to move some of them around. However, some of them might not stay fixed. So this one might stay where it is. This one and this one might. This one might move down to this one. Oops. This one might move over here. That might go back. Uh, I don't know. This one might go here. And that one might go back to itself. There might be a little snake going up here like this. So like, I can depict what a permutation of a finite set looks like by sort of this picture here. Now, given any permutation, there are going to be some fixed points, or maybe no fixed points, and there are going to be some non-fixed points. So if I split off the fixed points from the non-fixed points, what I've just done is picked a set of elements of u, and then picked a derangement of the other elements. A derangement is a permutation with no fixed points. So what this says is that a permutation is what happens when you put a set structure on some part of u, they'll be your fixed points, and you pick a derangement for the other ones. That is, you shift them all around a little bit. Um, another example of this, does this make sense to everyone? I, mean, I know it makes sense to some people. So the idea is permutation might be some fixed points. Derangements do not. So partition your set into fixed and not fixed, you've just got yourself a derangement and some fixed points. Ta-da! That's exactly what this product thing is doing. Another example is um, linear orders. So what does a linear order do? 
Well, say I look, I've got all the elements of my set, and I want to put them all in a line somehow. So I want to join these up with a, a line, which is going to put them in an order. Well, if my set is empty, then I can't do anything. I'm done already. If my set is not empty, then I'm going to pick a point. Well, a point is a set with a singleton structure. So that gives me x. And then I'm going to pick a linear ordering of the rest. So this is like a recursive definition. And then I get my new linear ordering by taking this to be the least element and joining it to this one. So the idea here is like, to put a linear ordering on a set, well, either it's empty, in which case I can't do anything, or I can pick out one element to be my least element and then linearly order the rest of them. So that gives me the species equation lin equals 1 plus x times lin, which is going to be very useful later for telling us how many linear orderings there are on a set of size n. Um, and it's just, I don't know, I, I like this kind of thing. Do, do people see why this one makes sense? Any questions? Anyone completely baffled and need me to explain anything, Kevin? Uh, so, um, for the definition, like, by definition, it's not commutative, right? Mm, um, no. So FG is not the same as GF, right? Oh, no, 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 no. no. no it's, it's equivalent, though. It's equivalent. It's equivalent. So it's equals. Because this, yeah, I mean, this this equals, yeah, I guess, yeah, 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 why not? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's also associative. Associative, not one of the loop, though. That's Cartesian part, right? And yeah. You want it. So when I write this equal sign, I don't oh. mean equals. I mean, oh, that's not really that's a little bit. Oh. Okay. So, yeah, all of this, I'm. I'm Whenever I write an equal sign, I'm talking about a weaker version of equality than we're normally used to. So, you know, if I could, I could write something like this to make it feel better each time I do it. But yeah. Peace with that. Yeah. You want me to do that? Yeah. You want me to do this? Okay. Okay. Well, that's fine. That's fine. This isn't. That's fine. That's fine. There we go. Okay, okay, are we happy? But Great. now your last equality there, I mean, that's flagrantly false. Whereas <sighs> the equality you corrected was sort of reasonably correct. Naturally, in you, it is isomorphic. <laughs> <laughs> Mathematicians. <laughs> the worst, but also the best. Okay, so I'm now ready, unless we have any more. Comments, questions, suggestions, corrections? I mean, why the, what's the problem to define multiplication as just f cross f u cross u? Oh, you can. Right that's the product. cross product. So that's the other one. So, so this is, yeah, that, that's what we call, there's two kinds of products. I forget exactly who they're named after. I think this one is the Hadamard product and this one is the Cauchy product or something like that. You could define this to be an operation. It's a perfectly good operation. It just turns out it doesn't behave quite as nicely with power series, which I'm going to talk about after I define the composition for you. Any questions? Okay. So, composition happens when you find a structure that is a structure of one kind or structures of another kind. So, for example, a hedge is a list of trees. It's a linearly ordered set of trees. So, for example, um, hedge equals lin composition with tree. That is to say, every hedge is a uh, linear ordered set of trees. What about a graph? Well, there's the notion of a graph, and there's a notion of a connected graph. Well, what's a connected graph? It's a graph where all the nodes are collected. So what's a graph then? Well, it's just a set of connected graphs. Right? So like, if, I, if my graph looks a little bit like this, then these are three connected graphs, which together form my big graph. So that tells me that my graph is a set of connected graphs, for example. Uh, there are a bunch of other things that you can do with this, as indeed we will. Um, so I guess I should tell you formally how to define composition. Well, what do you do? So if you're given two species f, then g composed with f of u is going to be a g, g structure of f structures of u. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a partition of u into f structures, and then I'm going to, on the set of f structures I've done, I'm going to give you a g structure. 
So this is going to be, see if I can do this from my mind. P is going to be a partition of U. For each of the partitions, I'm going to put, each of the elements in the partition, I'm going to put an F structure on it. So I'm going to say SV for V and P. So V and P means like one of the elements of the partition. And then I'm going to put a G structure on those things. So what's this? P is a partition of U. For each V, SV is an F structure on V. And T is a G structure on the set of all of the partitions. On the, sorry, on, ah, U, U. There we go. Something like that, right? So, whatever. The intuition is much more clear than the definition. You just write out the definition. It's the only thing it could be. Um, so, I guess I've already told you a graph is a set of um, connected graphs. The next one is going to be less trivial. So, but this one's really nice. I like this one a lot. And it's going to be important to what we do later. So I give you a set with, say, I don't know, let's give it nine elements. And I'm going to permute those elements somehow. OK? So, oh, and this point, I guess, goes to itself. So this tells you how this defines a function from the set to itself. It's not necessarily a permutation. OK, so uh, this is going to be. What am I doing? So I'm going to say end is the um, species of endo functions. That is, you know, functions from u to itself. I'm going to describe the species of endo functions as the composite of two other functions. Well, how am I going to do that? Question mark. <laughs> uh, this is a terrible picture I've drawn, so I'm going to draw a different picture. sends points to other points, maybe to themselves. I guess I could include that as an option. We can consider a permutation, sorry, a endo function, that is just an arbitrary function from a set to itself, as being a permutation of rooted trees. Hmm. I need color. The way I do this is, I notice that under my function, some points are cyclic. So if I keep applying my function f, I go from here to here to here to here to here to here, and I'm back there again. Some points are not cyclic. If I start here, then I go to here to here, and then I go around this loop forever. So I'm going to look at all the points that are cyclic and call them the root of a tree, and the tree that they're the root of is the set of things which ultimately map to them. So there's a rooted tree, here's a rooted tree, here's a rooted tree, it just has one element which is the root itself, here's a rooted tree, and here is a root of tree. Here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. And this little guy is a root of tree all by itself. Okay? So what does my endo function do? Well, it splits my set into a bunch of root of trees, and then it permutes those root of trees. And from a permutation of root of trees, I can recover what the endo function must look like. Because I can just draw this picture, and hey presto, to find the endo function on my set. So this tells me that every endo function is a permutation of rooted trees. Seem crazy? Sufficiently? <laughs> I don't know. So whenever you have an endo function, you can draw it as a picture like that. That tells you that you've got a bunch of cycles and a bunch of trees that come out of the cycles. So you can define the cycles sort of permute each of the connected components, if you like, of a set of rooted trees. Questions on compositions? It's easier if you just think of it in terms of um, the sort of more intuitive definition. Um, there are a bunch of other things, but in the interest of time, I think I'll just continue. Happy so far? 
as with every TSS talk I've ever done, I can never tell if I've lost the audience or I've been going too slowly. It's usually one or the other. Um, it rays. Okay, where's my chalk? So, I'm now going to move on to talking about generating series. Because so far all I've done is define stuff. I've defined stuff and I've related a bunch of things to each other, but the things I've related to each other are the things I've just defined, and I have not yet proved anything. So, I'm just going to give a definition. It's going to seem completely arbitrary until we start looking at the applications. So, the definition is as follows. So, if you're given a species F, then the generating series going to be a function which I'm going to call f of x, where x is a variable. It's a formal power series. It's not even a function. It's a formal power series, which is defined by summing over all of the natural numbers, which includes 0 by definition, uh, of fn times x to the n over n factorial, where fn is the number of f structures on a set of size n. That is, size of f of bracket n. So, if f were the species of graphs, this would tell me how many graphs there are in a set of n elements. So, like, graph of x is the sum of the number of graphs on the set of n elements times x to the n over n factorial. So, in fact, we can say that. So, graph of x is the sum. Well, what do we do? We pick a bunch of two element subsets of n. So, we pick a subset of the set of two element subsets of a set of size n, and that's how many graphs there are on a set of size n, times x to the n over n factorial. So that's like a completely boring example. That's like the number of graphs on a set of size n. Um, so what other examples have we seen? Well, how many ways are there of putting a set structure on a given set? One namely just the set again. So this is 1 times x to the n of n factorial, which we know and love as e to the x. So these just seem to be coming out of nowhere. Um, how about this? Perm is the sum of the number of permutations of a set of size n times x to the n over n factorial. They cancel. The sum over x to the n over all natural numbers is just 1 over 1 minus x. These are formal power series, so I'm abusing notation by assuming that we're in the radius of convergence or whatever. Um, same with linear orderings. So this, it turns out, is equal to lin of x, the number of bijections from a set of size n to any other set of size n is still n factorial. Um, what else? How many ways are there of putting a singleton structure on a set of size n? Well, none unless it has size 1. So I get 0 times x to the 0 over 0 factorial plus 1 times x to the 1 over 1 factorial 1 times x to the 1 over 1 factorial plus 0 times all the other bits. So that's another example. And now you're kind of seeing why I called this one x. Likewise, this only has non-zero coefficient when I'm talking about the empty set. And then it has coefficient 1. and if you return nothing, then it's going to be zero, and so now sort of the notation is beginning to make sense. Um, but the reason why we care about this stuff is quite simply because, well, if I look at the, the exponential generating series of a sum, I'm going to get the sum of the exponential generating series. If I look at the exponential generating series of a product, I'm going to get the product of the exponential generating series. And this is where the alternative definition of just doing f of u times g of u doesn't work. It gives you something else which is useful, but not this. Um, if you do the composite, then you get the composite. There is an operation that we call differentiation, where uh, the derivative of a species when applied to a finite set returns 
the set of f structures on the same set but with a new element added. That turns out to give you the derivative of their power series. And the fact that you can relate species to each other by these operations means that we can use the information given to us by the power series of a bunch of stuff to find out how many structures of a given size there are on a set of a certain size. So, <clears throat> pretending that we didn't know how to count the number of linear orders on a set of size n, we can still find out how many linear orders there are on a set of size n. Because we've already seen that a linear order is either, well, it's going to be an empty set, or you pick something to be the least element and then stick a linear order on the rest of it. What this tells you is that lin of x is 1 plus x times lin of x, applying that theorem because it's compatible with addition, multiplication, and so on. Rearranging, solving for lin of x, I obtain 1 over 1 minus x, which, when I write out the series expansion, is the sum of x to the n, which, when I divide and multiply by n factorial, tells me that the number of linear orders in the set of size n is n factorial. And so on and so forth. And you can keep doing this at nausea, <coughs> um, which I could very well do if I wanted to. Um, but I think I'd rather prove Cayley's formula for the number of trees on a set of size n, and then probably finish up there. So before I do that, are there any questions about the generating series that I've shown you so far? Structures? Okay. Is there some corresponding um, operation um, there? sort of um, corresponds to the integral. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Does it have the name? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? <laughs> uh, why, why do I have the n factorial? Why do I have to make a lot of tangents? Um, so the, okay. There is, an unsatisfactory answer I can give to that question, and a satisfactory answer I can't give to that question. So which one would you prefer? Satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the satisfactory answer that I can't quite give to that question is to do with things called groupoids. So um, you can think about these species as being... If you... Okay, how do I do this? If instead of talking about these things, we're just variables. If instead of talking about variables, we talk about sets in a kind of abstract sense. So instead of x here, I have an x. Then I can consider sums of products of sets as being like polynomials of sets. Species are then the polynomials which respect the action of Sm. So they have to be sort of symmetric. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking a sum of a product, well, okay, I'm taking a sum of a bunch of sets, but I'm not just taking the sets, I'm quotienting out by the action of Sn on the sets by saying that like the order of the uh, elements within the set don't matter. Like the, the order that, this here is like an ordered list of elements of x, and I'm saying that you can permute the elements and end up with the same thing. There are n factorial elements of the group Sn, which is where the n factorial comes from. But because I'm so new to this entire subject, although in maybe two weeks I could tell you exactly what I mean by that, I cannot tell you what I mean. But it has to do with the group SM acting on a bunch of sets. The unsatisfactory answer I could have given you was, that's what makes all of this work. <laughs> and so we just do it by convention. I like that. By convention is the answer that shuts up undergraduates. <laughs> Why do we take zero factorial equals one? Oh, by convention. <laughs> No, zero factorial equals one because there is one permutation of the set of the empty set. Okay, any other questions? I could rant about conventions even more if I wanted to. I, I care very much about the truth with a capital T. <laughs> How much time do I have? Oh, loads of time. Same. Okay, great. This is going to be perfect. Um, yes, yes, <coughs> yeah. Okay. So, here is a proof which uh, is called Cayley's formula. And this is the proof given by Andre Joao in his 1981 paper, which is that 
the number of labeled, I mean everything here is labeled, so the number of labeled trees on a set with n elements is equal to n to the n minus 2. And so labeled here means that our tree lives on bracket n and... What I'm saying is that like... Um, labeled trees, these would be the same. Okay. It doesn't have to live on bracket n, any set with n elements, but you know, by natural isomorphism or whatever, you know, we label variables in this consider the set of n elements. So here's a proof, and the proof is absolutely ridiculous. I think I giggled to myself when I read it. So, okay. I'm going to get this wrong, so don't hate me. I'm going to prove, before your very eyes, that... <laughs> so I'm going to prove, first of all, <laughs> that linearly ordered sets of rooted trees, that is, a list of rooted trees, is the same thing as a bi-rooted tree, by which I mean a tree which has two distinguished points, which I'm going to call a head and a tail. So let's see why this is true. If you give me a bunch of trees, then I can give you a bi-rooted tree, so these are all roots of the trees. This is a linearly ordered set of rooted trees. So this is tree number one, tree number two, tree number three, and so on. I obtain a bi-rooted tree by joining these up in order, saying this is the head and this is the tail. <coughs> Likewise, if you give me a tree God, what is this thing I'm drawing? I didn't really plan this. Um, I declare that, say, this is the head, and, oh, I don't know, let's call this the tail, just to really mess things up. Then I obtain a list of rooted trees, so there is a unique path from the head to the tail, because it's a tree. If there wasn't a unique path, it wouldn't be a tree. And then this here is tree number one, this is tree number two, this is tree number three, no, it's not. This is tree number three, and this is tree number four. So I get a list of rooted trees. So a linearly ordered set of, bi of rooted trees is the same as a bi-rooted tree. Okay? So how exactly do you get all the trees? Huh? How exactly do you draw each tree? You start with the head and then... So you look at the head, and then you look at all of the vertices coming out of the head that don't give you another one of these. So you consider all of the, all of the vertices on this spine here are going to be the roots of the rooted trees, and then they all have a tree coming out of them. Okay, sure. Yeah. Makes sense. So a list of bi rooted trees. A list of rooted trees is a bi rooted tree. They're equal, as equal as species, not equal, because what does equal mean in life? I've been worrying about that question for a long time. Okay. We're almost done. So what does this tell me? This tells me, well, okay, I also know that although linear orders on a set are different from permutations of a set, they have the same bloody loops. What do I mean by bloody loops? Power series, there we go. Okay. But we also know that the permutation of rooted trees is and then the endo function. So putting all this together, I obtain that endomorphisms, the power series of endomorphisms, is equal to lin r tree, perm r tree, n, okay, n r tree, lin r tree, by root tree. Okay? Now, this means that all of the coefficients are equal. So the number of endomorphisms on a set of size n is equal to the number of bi-rooted trees on a set of size n. 
there are n to the n endomorphisms. And to specify a bi-rooted tree, well, first of all, I specify a tree, and then I pick the two points to be the head and the tail, which tells me that the number of trees is n to the n minus 2. Done. Is that not the most ridiculous proof you've ever seen in your entire life? I don't know. Anyway, I was going to tell you a load of logic, but I'm not going to bother. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. So it seems like all this you really like start with sets and then you start putting structure on top of that. Can you do it where like let's say that I'm really only interested in structures that come on top of graphs? Mm -hmm. Like would there be a way to formalize that in this language? Or? I mean, yeah. Um, but a graph is a set. So a structure on a graph is just more structure that you're already putting on a set. In fact, if you're putting, yeah, I mean, how would I say this? Well, I guess the yes, category yes, is yes, yes, the yes. bijection. So, okay, right. so given any species, F, you can define a morphism of species to be a natural transformation of functors. So, to anyone else in the audience, that just means that, like, whatever. It, it, <laughs> so, I'm going to just invent some new notation. So, I don't want to call it spec because that means something else. So, let's say spe f to be the category of f species. Is that what I want to say? No, I just want to say speed. No, okay, I'm making this answer up as I go along. No, instead of like making up the answer, I'm going to think about it and we can speak about it right. at trivia later or something. Uh, but I will say this. Somehow out of an F species, you obtain the category of things with an F species structure. So maybe that's what I mean to say. So for example, so speed F is going to form a category. Um, so, for example, spi graph is going to be the category of graphs. The category of graphs comes with a natural functor to the category of sets, which just forgets that edges exist, just takes all the vertices. If you were to put a structure on the category of graphs, you'd obtain a new thing. Let's say the category of pointed graphs, right? So a pointed graph would just be a graph where you designate a point and say, you're special. There is then a natural functor to the category of graphs just by forgetting that the point is special, right? But then there's a composite down here, so like it's sort of the same thing going on. So if you put a category on a graph, that's the same as putting a category. If you put a category on a graph, that's the same as putting. Sorry, if you put a structure on a graph, that's the same as putting a structure on a set, which has a nice functor to the category of graphs, namely a faithful functor, which I guess we can talk about. Any other questions? Um, I'm a little, a little confused about this uh, bi-rooted tree thing. Yep. So, do the do there have to be two roots? Do they have to be different? They have to be different. Okay. No. So then, what happens so if you have an empty list of rooted trees? Or what if you, you have, have an empty list of rooted trees? Rooted is like, like pointed. You have to have a point to pick. Well, but then a bit like how can an can limb not be an empty? There is no empty rooted tree and there is no empty by rooted tree. Because you must but pick is there an empty lin of Yes. Right, so shouldn't there be like the the empty list on the left? No. Because what this spits out cannot be empty, so what goes into here cannot be empty. So what this does is it takes in a finite set and it spits out a rooted tree on that finite set. Right. And then it linearly, it linearly orders a bunch of those things. So like, you take a, you take a finite set, what this does, and it partitions it into a bunch of things. It puts a rooted tree on all of the partitions, all the sets in the partition, and then it linearly orders those rooted trees. So when I've partitioned my set, some of the sets in the partition could be empty. 
But root of tree will just say, nope, when it's given an empty set, and so that will never find its way into lin. Okay. So the only way that lin can do anything is if there is elements here, all the elements in the partition are inhabited, and... And there's at least one. And there's at least one. Okay. So emptiness can't cause problems here. What if I have... Sorry. So what if I have one point, yep. and that's the root of the tree, yep. and there's only one tree? Right. So this is a linearly ordered <laughs> set of root of trees. Yeah. It but is also a by root of tree. <laughs> okay. So they, yeah. Here is the root, and here's the head, and here's the right. tail. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Ed? Do you know what happens when you compose rooted trees with itself? Yes, you get a rooted tree of rooted trees. Um, I guess. So what would that be? Well, here's a rooted tree. Which is the root of a tree. And inside all of these are more rooted trees. So officially, that's just what a rooted tree of rooted trees is. You could probably interpret this. Um, you could probably interpret this by having. Oh, here's a way you could interpret this, right? So you could interpret this as being like a rooted tree, except now instead of a root at the top, you have like a whole tree. So what would this look like? So you'd have this one here. Okay. You'd have that one, and then like that one. <laughs> And then like that one, and then that one. Oh no, that's wrong. Sorry. So you can interpret it as being a tree with a I don't know sub tree consisting entirely of special points or something like that. I guess that would be an equivalence. And one of the points is super special. Oh, and this point is super <laughs> special. Right. So, yeah, so you have a rooted tree. So you have a tree with a special subtree, all of whose vertices are special, and one which is extra special. <laughs> so that's, I guess, what a rooted tree of rooted trees would look like. Yeah, you look more convinced. You okay? Okay, okay. Any other questions? Uh, Kevin? Yes. Let's say I give you a power series. Can you tell me what's the what's the uh, species? Can I? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, but, is there a way to well, say like this power series is the like the, no, one, the, the series of the species? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yes. Um, <coughs> so let me make sure I'm confident about my answer before I go any further with that. So I think you can define infinite series of species, or at least infinite series of stuff types. <coughs> but because I've not told you what a stuff or a stuff type is, I can't go into that. But you can definitely assign combinatorial meaning just by exponentiating these things and adding these things. You can get all the natural numbers by adding these together, and then you get arbitrary powers of x by adding these together. So certainly any polynomial you can assign meaning to. And I think that you can extend that to power series if you you know. also have e to the x. Yeah. Well, e to the, I mean, e to the x we've already got, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe so combine those functions together. Yeah, I don't know. That this probably you're probably going to end up going into like that weird Galois theory of functions, which are like um, elementary, you know, functions that can be built out of exponentials and logarithms and sines and cosines and whatever. And I don't know. There's probably an answer somewhere in that realm, but I don't know the answer. So. So that for now. <laughs> I'm confident that at least if you go as far as stuff types, you can assign some kind of combinatorial meaning to any power series. Would it have to have some kind of integrality condition? What? Because it's, kind of, it's coefficients of counting things. So you have ah, yes, things. but uh, the coefficients of the power series associated with a stuff type are real numbers, corresponding to the groupoid quotient. So the, the so groupoid um, groupoid cardinality cardinality of sets is always a natural number. Cardinality of groupoid is an element of zero infinity closed. So you can you can do a lot of stuff with those things. Stuff types groupoids. Any other questions?
questions?